Indeed, it looks like the recent snowfall has made the garden beautifully white out there. Later on, towards the evening, when I have switched on lamps to get comfortable indoor light, an accidental look through the window shows me the garden in deep blue light. This is the blue hour, when there is still a faint remain of daylight outside. Going outside to experience this, I find the light not particularly bluish, but instead the windows on the house give the impression of extraordinarily yellowish illumination inside, which uh, turns out to be ordinary neutral lighting as soon as I have come inside again. This is an example of chromatic adaptation. We usually experience the prevailing light as neutral, colorless. This makes it possible for objects to display their proper colors. There is a simple way of testing the chromatic difference between two illuminations, as in this case between indoor and outdoor light. On a table near the window, you place a sheet of white paper, fold a small piece of paper and put it on the table like this. The surface facing the window is strikingly blue. The opposite surface facing the room is yellow. Evidently, different kinds of illumination can by direct comparison side by side like this, simulate the appearance of surface colors. Until I move the test object and convince myself it is just white paper. By the way, I cannot resist showing you a funny device I once designed for an exhibition. You see a tower enclosing a room with five walls in different colors, and above it a dudicaeder made of white paper. When it drops down into the room, its sides, as you see, get colored with reflex light from the corresponding wall. You can imagine in practice any situation the prevalent illumination is a mixture of light coming from various directions, having been variously reflected and modified, be it from painted walls, be it from the sky or green foliage. Do the colors of objects change when seen in different qualities of illumination? Remarkably little, in fact. The perceptual constancy of object colors can be studied as follows. You see here a montage of colored papers, several nuances of red and yellow, a couple of blue, a green, a brown, together with white and black as reference areas. Look carefully now, see what happens. A transparent blue film is pushed over the picture, resulting in a number of mixture colors. With blue or yellow we get green. The blue color of the film itself is seen over the white paper. It is almost identical with the blue paper to the right. Blue areas get more saturated, whereas red areas become desaturated. When the film covers the whole picture, this astonishingly returns to its original look, let be in somewhat cooler light. The film, now not seen as belonging to the scene any longer, 
has taken on the role of converting incandescent light to simulated daylight. And if you take it away, the illumination changes to slightly warmer character, but the picture remains the same. The demonstration shows the effect of chromatic adaptation, which makes it possible for us to recognize and identify colored papers independently of the changing quality of illumination. What principles govern chromatic adaptation? Is it that the brightest area should take on the role of white? Or is it a common trend in the shift of all areas which guides perception? Probably both. Let us consider a more intricate situation. A picture composed of diverse color areas is hanging on a white wall onto which a blue shadow falls. Can you behold the picture despite this shadow? In an art gallery, probably yes. On closer scrutiny, you find that the white stripe at the right side has the color of the background. So it seems that the blue shadow influences the colors in the picture. Displaying the picture on black ground makes things even more intricate. You don't any longer see the shadow falling over it, and the question is, does it at all influence the color composition of the picture? It must, you feel obliged to say, but don't be too sure. Already in the 1960s, the ingenious Edwin Land, whom you may remember from my video on two-color projections, together with his collaborator John McCann, made a series of experiments, the so-called Mondrian demonstrations. They pointed out a simple fact. A colored area is never alone. On the contrary, in a natural situation there are lots of different colors making up the scenery. They further pointed out that for identification of surface colors, the borders between areas are more informative than the colored areas themselves, which in fact solves our problem. Let me show you how. Look at this simple picture. What do we see here? Well, we see a checkerboard pattern in black and white, illuminated from the right, making it slightly shaded on the left side. The interesting thing is that if you compare a black square at the outmost right with a white square at the outmost left, they turn out to have exactly the same grey tone. So what we are looking at is a pattern composed of grey tones. What is the objective truth here? That we see a regular checkerboard pattern in black and white or a layout of grey tones. Let us for a moment analyze the problem from a physical point of view. We have a pattern built from squares with 80% and 12% reflectance respectively. And below you see how it looks in homogeneous light. Then you illuminate it with light falling from the right side from a close by source, giving an illuminance on the picture board like this, resulting in a luminance pattern like this, making a white square at the left reflect the same intensity of light as a black square at the right side, as we just saw. Now, suppose the eye registers the luminance jumps at the borders, 
var Arias meat. This will go up a factor seven to one, then at next border, down one to seven, next up seven to one, and so on, independently of the illumination at the place of that border. Thus, the registered pattern of surface reflectances would be as if in homogeneous light, shown in the left figure. Simultaneously, information about the gradient of the illumination is given by the successively darker surfaces when going from right to left. So, what we see is a checkerboard pattern in black and white illuminated from the right. So far, we have been dealing with pictures, but real life takes place with three-dimensional objects in space. Then, the variability in the play of light and surface materials is even more intricate. Trying to imitate chromatic adaptation, digital cameras adjust to the color temperature of a scene by flexible individual calibrations of the three channels. Look at the following example. When directed towards the table, the camera tends to make the white paper look white in lamplight. And then the computer screen looks blue. Directed more towards the screen, this may come to look grey, as it should in this case, but then the paper on the table is orange, yellow. The point is now that for me, sitting there, working at the screen, both the paper and the screen are seen as neutral, simultaneously. It seems that human vision is capable of handling two scenes with different illumination qualities simultaneously present within the field of view. In the world around us, there is a continuously ongoing play between light and matter. In practical life, there will always be the task of identifying object colors under shifting illumination conditions. I have shown you that this is usually possible to a sufficient degree of accuracy. If your intention instead is to find joy in the wonderful play of ever-shifting light and shadow, you don't bother about letting objects have their true or real colors. Light weaves everything together. <laughs>